So it's hardly surprising that the Israeli military is not keen to prosecute Israeli children in these courts. So the way the military gets around that issue is they provide a discretion to the military prosecutor. So although the court has jurisdiction over settlers, the um, prosecutor has a discretion to either prosecute the settler in the military court or in Israel's civilian courts. And in pretty much every case, the prosecutor will exercise his discretion to prosecute the Israeli civilian settlers in Israeli civilian courts, which, as I said before, have many more rights and protections than you find under military law. So although the courts have jurisdiction over everyone, they are fairly much in practice uh, exclusively reserved for Palestinians in the West Bank. What perhaps is interesting from a legal perspective is the military order that established the military courts on the 7th of June 1967 expressly referenced the Fourth Geneva Convention as the jurisdictional basis for the military courts, which legally is correct. Um, then what happened is sometime between June 1967 and August 1967, a political decision was obviously taken in Israel to start to settle the West Bank. Um, that's obviously inconsistent then with the same convention. Now the way the Israeli military authorities got around that was not particularly sophisticated. They passed another military order that just deleted references to the Fourth Geneva Convention, but continued to apply the Fourth Geneva Convention. And what's interesting with the work we do in the West Bank, as you mentioned, we have access to the military courts and we take quite a lot of delegations, political delegations, others, to the military courts. When you arrive at the military court near Ramallah, near Jerusalem, you're usually met by generally a very polite military officer, and he will hand out leaflets to explain to you why everything you see there is lawful, why it is lawful to prosecute Palestinian civilians. Pamphlets in English or something? In English. Okay. Uh, why it is lawful to prosecute Palestinian civilians in military courts. And what's quite intriguing, from my perspective anyway, of this document, is it expressly references Article 66 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. So to this very day, Israel is relying on provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention to justify the prosecution of civilians in military courts, which legally is correct, subject to the fact it's 51 years now. Um, but on the other hand, when anyone raises the issue of Israeli settlements in the West Bank, Israel says the convention doesn't apply. Now, you don't need to be a lawyer to know that that is an unsustainable or a, uh, not a strong argument to pick and choose which legal obligations you're going to comply with when it suits you. Like a smorgasbord, you take the bits of food you like and you ignore the other bits. And from our perspective, from an international perspective, I think the concern there is that this has um, serious implications for the credibility of the international legal order established at the end of the Second World War. So for example, let's broaden our gaze a little bit. Um, as you know, Israel has annexed, formally annexed East Jerusalem. It hasn't been recognized by anyone. Um, but when, say for example, Putin annexes Crimea or the rest of Ukraine, and people object to that because it it's violates Article 2 of the UN Charter, non-acquisition of territory through force. If I was Putin, I would say, tell it to the Israelis. They've annexed East Jerusalem. Why should we not annex Crimea? We have a, Russia has a historical connection to Crimea, and there are facts on the ground, the same arguments used by Israel. And the same with the South China Sea, as you'd all be familiar. China is busy building islands, um, pouring concrete on reefs in the South China Sea, in what is the busiest shipping lane in the world, over a trillion dollars worth of trade runs through the South China Sea. Um, totally illegal, but if I were the Chinese government, I would say we clearly have a historical connection to the South China Sea, and there are facts on the ground. We've poured a lot of concrete on these places. And the problem is, then we start to undermine the credibility, as I said, of that entire legal system. And we have to cast our minds back to why we developed this legal system. You know, it came out of enormous sacrifice and uh, bloodletting of two world wars that uh, world leaders then came together and said we have to find 
a better solution to resolving our, our disputes. And you just have to read the preamble to the UN Charter, which says words to the effect of twice in our generation has the scourge of war descended. So what's our solution to this? And right at the top of the list is the rule of law. And the problem is the danger for this conflict, if you're not Israeli, Jewish, or, or Palestinian, I think, is its ability to undermine that international legal system. And we in Europe, we might need some of these protections one day, uh, particularly as this century proceeds and there's more and more uh, pressures and tensions. We are moving from up and down now on the general level and on the concrete, on the, the, the uh, ordinary day life level in Eastern Palestine. But I would like to ask you, Lena, about what Gerard is uh, talking about now. Uh, uh, the legitimacy of the, the international humanitarian law. Um, many of us see uh, Save the Children as an organization who, who work on the ground, uh, supporting children, or, or we, we give support to, to give some money monthly maybe to your organization, but you have also a very important role on the international political level. Uh, can you say something about that? Uh, I mean, say the children, you are an international organization, and, and as I understood, you you work internationally together with your partners. What is the difference between say the children and Sweden and on the global? Uh, yeah, Sweden, uh, say the children is a, a global movement uh, with uh, members all over the world, both from uh, developed and developing countries. If you excuse that term. And uh, we work both, as you said, on the ground, actually, uh, with partners, mainly with partners, because we see that building uh, partners' capacity is what, the most sustainable way, actually, to, to achieve a long-term uh, uh, change for children. Uh, so we very much base our work on child rights programming, which means that you put children at the center, you work with the children have the right to participate in decisions that would actually affect their lives or when they are involved. So the, it's participation. It's also important that children also can be empowered to hold like duty bearers accountable. So uh, and also working with non-discrimination and equality are like important foundations when we work with child rights programming with together with partners all over the world. Uh, Having said that, we also work very hard. On, uh, we have also advocacy work because we need also to change, as you said, the international legal norms. But what is most important right now is probably to kind of have a recommitment to international standards and laws because they are, as we heard here, they are not adhered to and it's important to kind of bring them back. So we do advocacy work. Uh, one important thing that we've been doing is uh, together with the Swedish government that is now uh, being, a, um, as we know, <laughs> a member of the UN Security Council. And the Swedish government, uh, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, has, have actually uh, been leading a, a group in the UN Security Council that is working um, the, uh, together with some other members to, to prevent children from, uh, children in armed conflict, to prevent children from being recruited as child soldiers to work on reintegration, etc., so that children will be less affected and, ha and see commitment from different countries to kind of uphold this. So this is an important advocacy work where we have supported and worked closely together with, with our government. So this, these are a couple of examples. We will also work with these issues on the EU level. We have office in Brussels, but then we have, as I said, office in New York to kind of work on, with um, advocacy on a global level. Uh, and this is all supported by the whole movement, so that we can do that advocacy work also on the global level, which is important that you complement what you do on the ground with important advocacy work, so that we can change also and have a recommitment to international uh, standards. In Terracourt Watch, you are a small organization. Uh, we, uh, as I have understood, uh, with a network of lawyers, both from Israel and Palestine, uh, can you take us back to the ground and say, what are you actually doing? What is your daily activities? Yes, so we, um, the first thing we do, we collect a lot of evidence. Um, so about, we collect testimonies from probably about 10% of the children who are detained each year by the military. It works out at about 
120, 150 testimonies each year. Um, we analyze those testimonies for a number of issues, particularly um, how they're treated upon arrest. Uh, one issue of concern is that many children are arrested in military raids in the middle of the night, so we document that. Um, the use of blindfolds, um, various forms of mistreatment. And we also look to see, are their legal rights, particularly under Israeli military law, respected? So whilst you're, you do have limited rights under military law, you do have rights. And so under Israeli military law, you have the right to silence. And you have, in, in most cases, the right to consult with a lawyer prior to uh, interrogation. And so we monitor whether those rights are being respected. Um, and then we produce a lot of reports and brief, do a lot of briefings based on, on that evidence. Um, basically, we have six recommendations, and we've chosen them as to be very practical and very simple, and where possible to um, uh, reflect Israeli military law, because you're more likely to have success if you're trying to hold the Israeli military to its own regulations than to, say, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So things like you should be able to consult with a lawyer in every case prior to questioning, right to silence, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, like I said, we, we also then do a lot of briefings, uh, dipl dip dip diplomats, media, politicians. Um, over the years, we've taken, I think, 10% of the UK parliament to the military courts. Um, and that has a profound effect on people generally when you take them to the military courts. Um, and so what has happened is this issue is quite prominent in the UK Parliament. Uh, there have been, I think, three or four debates on this issue, one earlier this year, on the issue of child detention in the military system, based probably mainly because so many people have actually been to the military courts themselves. And then as lawyers, we also look to see, is there anything can be, that can be done to um, try and improve the situation from a legal perspective? You and I, we, we visited uh, Barnens Tankes Media, the children's, uh, where children ask questions to, to politi politicians, and, and we consider that the children's questions are very good because they are very simple and straightforward. So th this is a, a, that kind of question. I mean, why are children, Palestinian children, taken to the military court? Or why are they seen as a threat mm. from the Israeli side? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that we collect a lot of evidence and we analyze that evidence for all a number of different features. When we do this analysis, there's always one particular feature that really strikes us as significant. And that is the location of arrest. Where are these children, where do they actually live? And where are they arrested? And in about 98% of the evidence we collect, the children live and are arrested within one kilometer of a settlement, an Israeli settlement in the West Bank. It's essentially a settlement issue. <clears throat> and to understand that, I think you have to walk in the shoes for a moment of an Israeli military commander and ask yourself, what mission has he been given? Because once you understand that, I think you understand the dynamics in the West Bank better. And basically the mission he's been given by the politicians in Israel is they've taken the decision to move 600,000 Israeli civilians into occupied territory as illegal settlers. And then once they've taken that decision, they hand the job over of actually protecting all of those civilians to the Israeli military. And if you stop and think about that for a moment, I think it's a very difficult, potentially challenging job that you could give any military in the world than having to guarantee the protection of 600,000 civilians uh, living in illegal settlements amongst three million Palestinians. And the question is, how do you do that? How do you make that work? And we see the sort of tactics that are used in our work. And essentially, what we find is, if you live in Ramallah or one of the cities, you probably won't have much contact with the Israeli military. But if you're, you have the misfortune to be a Palestinian living in a refugee camp or a village located within a few kilometers of a settlement, you will have a constant military presence in and around your village. Um, the idea being that the people in that village have to be intimidated into submission because frequently they've lost a lot of agricultural land to create the settlement. 
there's a lot of friction, a lot of animosity, and, and there is some violence. People, uh, the most common offense children are prosecuted for is throwing stones at settlers, at soldiers, at settler vehicles. And the problem from that military commander's perspective is how do you, uh, how do you guarantee the protection of those settlers? And it is through that intimidation process. And I think perhaps one measure of the success of the military is that according to the US State Department, uh, they put out an annual report on human rights every year for every country in the world. According to the US State Department, in 2012, not a single settler was killed in the West Bank. And that just strikes me as an extraordinary military achievement. The, the nine-year average is 5.7 settlers killed each year in the West Bank. Now, not to trivialize those deaths, more people get killed on the roads. Um, but you have to understand that that result comes at a very high price for the Palestinians who live in close proximity to the settlements. And I think that's one reason why settlement construction in occupied territory is illegal under international law, because it inevitably leads to this sort of thing happening.